the, the title of this kind of series with uh, Philippians chapter 4 is weird. And the reason why I chose that word is because of its definition. And we talked about last week how the actual definition, the formal definition of weird is suggesting something supernatural or unearthly. Typically, we use the word to refer to anything that's strange or bizarre. But the formal definition actually implies that there's something supernatural going on here. And so I'm taking this word and applying it to our Christian life so that when we actually live in the way Paul's calling us to, which is to rejoice in the Lord always, to let our gentleness be known to everyone, to not be anxious about anything, but in everything, through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let our requests be made known to God. When we live in those kind of joyful, gentle, um, meek, patient, kind, good ways, thoughtful ways, it's weird. And it's weird because it is only possible through the empowering of the Holy Spirit of God. We can't just conjure this kind of life up. Can't just try harder. We have to be dependent upon a supernatural divine source to have this kind of joy in the midst of the real difficult trials of life. This kind of gentleness in a polarized society. This kind of uh, peace when there's so many things that could bring anxiety into our lives. It's supernatural. And it doesn't happen overnight. You can't just hear a sermon on this and all of a sudden you're good to go. It just doesn't happen that way. And so what we looked at last week was as we wrestle with these realities, we are to remember Jesus Christ. We are to enter into this process by which we will become more joyful in him, more gentle by him, more peaceful in his presence. It's a process we enter into, and it, it takes a long time. It takes a lifetime to learn this kind of way, this way of Jesus Christ that is weird. And I think we need to remember the, the process piece of the Christian life, because I think we live in an instant society. We want everything overnight, right? We want to we wanna have a microwave version of Christianity where I can just push a button 10 seconds and boom, I'm like Mr. Spiritual. But it doesn't happen that way. We're on a lifelong journey of discipleship. And it will take a lifetime to grow in even the smallest ways towards Christ. But every step is one that is empowered by His Spirit and given by grace. There's a great quote from Scott McKnight, and he says this, We Christians are too often addicted to stories of dramatic and extraordinary grace. But grace isn't just found in the dramatic. Grace is at work in the stories of ordinary girls and boys who grow up in ordinary homes and who go on to live ordinary Christian lives in ordinary churches with ordinary jobs. It's the same power of grace at work. Slow, steady transformation remains transformation. And there is, a, there is a way that we are to be in this world. In whatever situation you find yourselves, in whatever circumstance you find yourselves, we are on this steady, slow movement towards Christ. And as each, with each step, it's supplied by grace. As you practice joy and gentleness and peace and what we're going to look at this morning, contentment, as we practice these things, no one's, no one's going to write about you. <laughs> no one's going to like think, whoa, this person's life, we gotta, they rejoice in the Lord always. We've got to put that in a book. But it's so crucial. They're not going to write a book about how you have to encounter daily with your children the call to be joyful and to be at peace. They're not going to write about how at your workplace you have to struggle to be gentle and content. They're not going to write about the time this Thanksgiving when you're sitting down with your hostile family members trying to love them. They're not going to write about it. But this is Christianity. This is the way of Jesus. This is what he's calling us to. This is the supernatural, weird kind of lifestyle that he's inviting us into. 
We looked at joy and we said, hey, remember Jesus, the gracious king. There is joy in our salvation no matter what circumstances surround us. We looked at gentleness and we said, remember Jesus, the gentle king who showed us what meekness and humility looks like. We said, look at, look at peace and remember Jesus, the good king who has your best interests in heart and he is working all things together for your good and you can let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. So now what's he gonna say in Philippians 4 verse 10? Let's read this together. Or not together, but read it with me, but I'll, I'll read. You don't have to say it out loud. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble, and you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. This morning, we're going to focus in on the first section of this, which is Philippians 4, verses 10 through 13. Because in this verse, he talks about what he calls the secret of contentment. The secret of contentment. But let's talk about the problem first. And this is actually going to be my easiest task this morning. Okay? Um, my easiest task this morning is to prove to you that discontentment is a problem in your life. Some things are hard to convince people of, right? It's hard to convince someone who thinks they're wise that they're actually quite foolish and ignorant. It's hard to convince someone who thinks they're free and autonomous that autonomous freedom is in fact a form of slavery. And it's hard to convince someone who thinks they're right that they are wrong. But to convince you that covetousness Envy and jealousy are daily battles of your life. This is going to be easy. Because I know this in my own heart, and I know what it's like to be human. My dad growing up, every time I would complain, he would say, life's not fair. Right? Life's not fair. Tough. That was his word. Tough. He would just say that word to me when I was crying and weeping at his feet. Tough. Life's tough. No sympathy, no empathy. Thanks a lot, Dad. You know, but, but he was trying to communicate something to me. That life is not fair. It's not. It's sometimes really hard. It's sometimes really difficult. And even when it's good, we're still never satisfied. I mean, if I were to think of all the examples in my growing up years of having good things, but immediately growing covetous of someone else's experience and possessions, they're, they're endless. We would wake up on Christmas morning, early, like on the 21st, because we went to my grandparents' house on the 25th, and I would get to open all of my presents on December 21st. Yeah, that was cool. And I'd open them all up, and we, my mom loved Christmas, and she loves gift giving, so it's, it, it was a thing in our house. And so we got all these presents, and then we'd go to my grandparents' house with all of my cousins, and they'd bring their presents. And what was amazing Two days earlier, all the stuff that I was playing with, all the new video games that I had, and all the, all the great things, I didn't get that Nerf gun. And I was immediately wanting more. It immediately wasn't enough. I didn't get that new piece of technology that just came out. I went to a restaurant one time at a marriage retreat with One Savior Church, and we went to this sushi place. And Marie and I were trying to, you know, spend less. So we ordered, like, you know, the simple sushi. But the people we were with ordered the special sushi. And when our sushi came out, I was thinking, yeah, sushi, this is going to be good. I love sushi. Sushi is satisfying. It's good. But then when they brought out their sushi, it looked so much cooler. It had more 
taste to it. It had more nuances to it. it had more, more raw fish on it and just everything. I, and, and, and all of a sudden, I'm looking at my plate, which on any other day at any other place would have been really exciting to me. And I look over at their plate, and I'm like, hmm, oh, this is kind of lame. You know, you go on vacation, and you're enjoying the freedom of vacation, and then you pull up Facebook, and your friend's also on vacation. And they got to go to Disney World, which has never been a problem for me. But I did just this week. Okay, so this is just how embedded this is. Just this week, I'm preparing a sermon on contentment this week. And a few days ago, I'm complaining to Maria about a family that got to go to the mountains for their family vacation, and when our family did something like that, we went to the beach. And I wanted to be in the mountains, because the mountains are cooler, and they're better, and they're more scenic, and it's just all, everything about the mountains is better than the beach. Personal opinion, but it's true. And so, but I was just this week lamenting the fact that I didn't get to go to the mountains, as if I should be complaining about a paid-for vacation to the beach. What is wrong with us? Or me. <laughs> These are all personal illustrations. What's wrong with me? We can even do this in ministry. Man, if only I could, if only we could all live in Texas and go to Matt Chandler's church. If only we could be at a church that functions like Francis Chan's church. If only I could have that person's leadership gifts, that theologian's intellectual prowess, that pastor's speaking abilities, that missionary's passion for the Lord. If only I could be in their circumstance, have their gifts, have their situation, then I'd be content. I read this from a book um, it's called The Envy of Eve, written, written by Melissa Kruger. And she said this, we may have been wandering through life quite content with what we were wearing, driving, or experiencing until all of a sudden we become aware that someone out there has something more. The blessing of our income level can turn sour the moment we hear that another friend works less and makes more. The home that seemed so wonderful two years ago begins to pale in comparison to our neighbor's new addition. We hear that a friend's husband sent flowers just because and suddenly have the sinking feeling that we are missing out. While walking through the grocery store, we spot a well-dressed woman with the figure we would love to have and begin to grow discontent with our own shape and size. The comparison trap can come upon us when we least expect it. Everywhere we look, we are bombarded with the quest for more. What is wrong with us? Proverbs 14.30 says this, A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. Envy rots the bones. This kind of way of life, this thinking, this lack of contentment will destroy us. So what is the secret of contentment? But well, before we talk about the secret of contentment, we have to talk about what it's not. Not. What is not the secret of contentment? Okay? Because we can get confused on what contentment really is, so we need to break down what it's not first. First of all, the secret of contentment is not indifference. It's not indifference. You see, when Paul says in verse 11, he says, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be contented content. I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. That little phrase in that verse actually sounds very similar to a philosophical system that existed in that day. This would have sounded familiar to the Philippian church. There was a belief called Stoicism, and it was this whole phil philosophical system. And here's what one Stoic philosopher said. His name was Seneca. And it's very similar. He says, the happy man is content with his present lot, no matter what it is, and is reconciled to his circumstances. So this isn't anything new. Like, this isn't anything inherently Christian yet. Just to be content in your circumstances. But here's where you get a little clue as to the difference of Stoicism to what Paul is calling us to. 
He says also, the wise man is sufficient unto himself for a happy existence. Indifference is the decision to be self-sufficient, to not let your circumstances bother you, rise above them, don't let them, don't let them mess with you, don't let them mess with your peace. You can choose to be better. You can choose to not let your circumstances hinder you. You, you, you can do this. The goal of Stoicism was to live above need and abundance in such a way as to be self-sufficient. The problem with this is that the strength needed for this kind of life lies within yourself. And this is the very opposite of the Christian way. To rise above your circumstances, to, to keep your head above the waters like we just sang, if that's dependent on you, then it's merely just a cover for an underlying dualist perspective of life that treats the physical as evil and the spiritual as good. All the things that happen in our circumstances in our life, that's evil, that's matter. This was the whole philosophy of the early centuries. And all that is physical is bad, all that spiritual is good, and so as long as you don't let the physical affect you, you can live on a higher spiritual plane. But this is really just indifference to the real hard realities of life. It's really just an escapism that doesn't actually deal with the heart. The second thing that the contentment is not is comparison. It's comparison. A lot of times when we're feeling discontent, we'll just try to compare ourselves to a lower standard or we get discontent because we're comparing ourselves to a higher standard. Here's another Stoic philosopher. His name is Epictetus. He says this, he is a wise man who does not grieve for the things which he has not, but rejoices for those which he has. Now that's good wisdom. That's sound advice. You can put that one on your wall, right? That's, that's, that's good wisdom, sound advice. The problem with this, though, is that the joy is still being found in what you have. You're still rejoicing in what you do have. It's a very similar argument that we often make to our children when they're complaining at the table. And, they, and we say to them, a lot of people in the world have a lot less than you, so be grateful. I mean, your heart and my heart, I've said these things to my children, that we're, they're, they're, they're intentionally good as we try to teach our children gratefulness. The problem is you're still putting the emphasis on what you have. You're still saying people have less than you, so be grateful because you have this. The circumstance, the situation, the possession is still what you're calling them to put their joy in. But contentment does not result from the realized fact that other people have it worse than you. I mean, does this work for you? Does the fact that you know other people are worse off than you help you grow in contentment? It doesn't change the heart. It doesn't fix our discontentment or our complaining because it's a law-based argument. When you mention, say, the starving children in Africa, you are in essence trying to make your child feel really bad about complaining by saying there's people worse off than you. You shouldn't be doing this. It's a law. It's a command. You're not supposed to complain. What's your motivation for not complaining? Because there's people who are worse off than you are. But there's no grace there. Just hard facts that you hope will produce a happily eating child. But comparison to lower standards or more difficult situations won't teach us the secret of contentment. And it really doesn't take away the constant bombardment of life that reveals all sorts of other people having it better than we do. All you have to do is look at any social media page and you quickly realize that other people are happier, smarter, richer, and better than you are. This comparison game we play within ourselves, even subconsciously at times, leads to covetousness, envy, and jealousy. These ways of the flesh are the complete opposite of the contented way of the Spirit. So if 
it doesn't help us to just grow indifferent to our circumstances and just try to escape and live above them. If it doesn't help us to just compare ourselves to lower standards, how is it that, how is it Paul, we're going to look at the text now, how is it Paul that we can be in our hearts changed into a people who live with contentment, who can say with Paul that we've learned the secret of facing plenty and of having need. So verse 10, Paul has received an unexpected gift from the Philippians. One reason why he's writing this book is to thank them for their generosity towards them. And actually next week we'll talk about the generosity that's going on and the partnership in the gospel that's taking place between them. But look what he says in verse 10. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. You know what the Greek word for that is? I don't really know Greek all that well, but this is kind of cool. Megalos. Mega. I know that word. It's English. Megalos. He rejoiced in the Lord greatly. He is expressing mega joy because of this gift that was given to him. And then in verse 11, he does something very strange. If you've just received a gift from someone, typically you don't say, thanks for the gift. I didn't really need it. But that's what Paul does, sort of. Verse 11, he says, not that I am speaking of being in need. That not that is one Paul typically uses when he's trying to counter some misconceptions. What he's saying is he doesn't want them to think that he's asking for more. You see, in this century, to write a thank you letter that expressed mega joy in the gift was a subtle hint that you need to send me more. So Paul's trying to kind of rhetorically balance both a thankful heart, but he's not wanting them to think that, that he's asking them for more money. So that's why he's kind of playing this like line that's kind of hard. He's, he's doing this really well, actually, if you actually know the culture and, and understand the language. And so he says, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned this is the secret. In difficult circumstances and in easy circumstances, he says, in whatever situation I am to be content, I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance, abundance and need. He's got all these like comparisons going on. Paul's saying whether he's doing really, really well or whether he's in deep need, he has learned the secret of contentment. I think we need to take a little bit of a sidebar here because notice what he just said. He said that he's learned the secret of contentment for when things are going really well. Did you know that in order to be a content person, you not only need to know the secret when you are facing need, but you also need the secret when you are facing abundance. Ecclesiastes 2, 10 through 11. I think it should be up there for you to read. And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done, and the toil I had expended in doing it, and behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind. There was nothing to be gained under the sun. This is a person who experienced the good life, as we would maybe imagine that to be if you're letting the commercials define that for you. And he, he's getting everything he needs. He's gaining all the wisdom he needs. He's getting everything his heart desires. And yet he still is not content. Isaiah 55, 2, the prophet says, Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? You could be in abundance. You could be having the money to spend on anything you want. And it still is not satisfying your soul. The heart of the wise man in Proverbs 38 through 9 says this, give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. You see what he's saying? He's saying there's a danger to having abundance as well. 
There's a danger to having plenty as well. And the secret of contentment will balance you out when you are both in need and when you have abundance. Because it'll keep you centered in the secret, which we're going to discover in just a second. One more verse, 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 12. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich, notice what he's talking about contentment and then he addresses the rich. Contentment is not in the Bible a message for the poor, it's a message for the rich. The poor are often, sometimes, and many times, the ones who are enduring the the systems and the evil and the injustice of the world that needs to be fought against and worked against. It's the rich who need to know the secret of contentment, maybe even more so. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. The secret of contentment needs to be learned by those of us who are existing in abundance. Typically, the more you have, oftentimes you can find the less happy, the less satisfied, and the less content you are. Because we're always on this quest for more. I can't tell you how many times people have gone on mission trips or something, they've visited people from other countries, and they're happier there. And yet they have less. Let's go back to the text. Let me, the the big point is that our material status, the things we own and possess, that's not the standard of our contentment. That's the big point. That's not what we base our contentment on, what we have or what we don't have. The secret is something else. Let me read you this text again, this time from the kind of paraphrased explanation of it in the message. This is how Eugene Peterson kind of summarizes this. Actually, I don't have a sense of needing anything personally. I've learned by now to be quite content, whatever my circumstances. I'm just as happy with little as with much, with much as with little. I found the recipe for being happy, whether full or hungry, hands full or hands empty. Whatever I have, wherever I am, I can make it through anything in the one who makes me who I am. You want to know what the secret of contentment is? You ready? You ready for the secret? Don't tell anyone. No, this is a secret you can tell. Anyone, everyone. Here's the secret to contentment. It's Jesus. I know your minds are blown right now. I wasn't expecting that. You were hoping for something really profound. Something new. Something that would finally give you the clue or the answer, but it's just Jesus, and it's only Jesus, and it's all Jesus because Jesus is all you need. It's not in what we have or what we don't have. It's not in our material possessions. It's not in our income, in, our, in, our, in the things we own, in the house we live in, in the car we drive. It's not in any of that. It's in Jesus Christ. He is the secret of contentment. And this is what Paul says. He says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Through Jesus. Because Jesus is all Paul needs. So remember, enter, look. Those are the three movements. Remember, enter, look. Remember Jesus. Enter the process and look to your home as we grow in contentment. Remember Jesus, the glorious King. Remember his example, Matthew 8, 19 through 20. He said, and a scribe came up and said to him, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. 
Philippians 2, in this book, we talked about how Jesus took what was glory and divine power and he emptied himself and became obedient to the point of death, even a death on a cross. He humbled himself. He knew. He knows plenty and he knows need. Jesus Christ knows glory and he knows humiliation. He knows joy and he knows pain. And he has experienced our burdens. He has experienced our joys and our sorrows. And because he knows this and he empathizes with our weaknesses, he becomes a ready and present help in time of trouble. We can run to him. We can go to him. His, his, we can go to his essence of who he is. Now, Paul, in Philippians, what did he say in chapter 1, verse 21? To live is Christ. What did he say in chapter 2, verse 8? I count everything as loss in view of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. Jesus is everything to Paul. Jesus is all Paul needs. If Christ is everything to you, then he is your joy. If Christ is everything to you, then he is your hope. If he's everything to you, then he is your strength. If he's everything to you, then he is your peace. Not the things of this earth. Not the things of this world. Not the experiences and the pleasures that we get within this world. Nothing physical or circumstantial is your source of joy, peace, hope, or comfort. It's all in Christ. And here is, this is, this is incredible. It, this means, and this is so countercultural. This is so weird. This is weird in our culture. Because it means that your house is not your source of joy, peace, and hope. It means that your spouse, I'm sounding like Dr. Seuss here. It means that your spouse is not your source of joy, hope, and peace. It means that your job is not your source of joy, hope, and peace. It means that your children are not your source of joy, hope, and peace. It means that your car is not your source of joy, hope, and peace. It means that your physical health is not your source of joy, hope, and peace. Every situation we find ourselves in, good or bad, is able to be endured in a godly way because nothing circumstantial is where we find our ultimate joy, hope, and peace. Jeremiah Burroughs was an old Puritan writer. He wrote a book called The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment. And he compares the difference between contentment and covetousness. And he says, he says this, he says that external heat, he compares it to heat. He says external heat, say from a fire, is only temporary. The moment you step away from it, you're cold again. He says, that's covetousness. It might work for a moment. It might warm you up for a second. But then the moment you lose it, the moment it's not there, you're back to being cold again. Whereas the heat that comes from your body actually comes internally and it heats up everything on you. Like you put on a cold shirt. It's cold at first, right? But because of the way God made us, it, our, our bodies exude heat. And so it actually warms the shirt up and it comes from an internal source. He says, this is contentment. A heat that has the power to face the coldest of situations and bring its warmth. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Okay, that's the last part we got to talk about this morning. This verse has been misunderstood. This verse has been misapplied abundantly. It has been wrenched from its context and has not been understood well. Some will even be, as, some will even be so audacious that they will come to this verse and they will quote it and they'll stop in the middle and they'll say, I can do all things. That's not what this verse is saying. It's not saying that you can do all things, anything you want, whatever you feel like. I remember all the posters when I was a kid of a, of a guy, you know, a goalie in the soccer field, and he's like launched out, you know, like parallel to the ground, stopping a ball, and underneath it goes, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Right? If you have Christ, you can be a really good soccer player. 
You know, the athletes and the interview afterwards, you know, they, they had some game-winning touchdown, and they're all like, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And it's good that they're giving some recognition, but it's a misapplication of the verse. The verse to be applied well would actually be going to the loser who just lost everything they've been working for all year long and say, hey, how are you feeling right now? He's like, oh man, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I'm feeling pretty content. Because my, my joy and my hope and my peace wasn't in that victory. It's in Christ. There's actually something interesting just exegetically here. Ben Witherington III in his commentary, he says that literally translated, it says, I am able all things. So people have translated, I can do, but he says the adding of the infinitive to do is actually not in the text. He says, contextually, it would be better to say, I am able to endure all things through him who strengthens me. I am able to cope with all things through him who strengthens me. The main point is that the verse is not telling you and me that we can do whatever we set our minds to as long as we rely on Christ's strength. It's saying you can be content in your circumstances no matter what comes your way because your contentment is found in Christ and he will strengthen you to endure the trials and the tribulations that you face. When you have Christ, the one of surpassing worth, his strength will enable you to endure the difficulty of remaining dependent on God when your life is being lived in abundance and the difficulty of trusting God when your life is overwhelmed with need can both be endured with contentment because Christ is your strength. We don't celebrate self-sufficiency like the Stoic philosophers and like our modern-day pop gurus. We celebrate Christ's sufficiency. Jesus Christ is everything. So remember Jesus, and then enter the process. Enter the process of walking with Jesus and learning to be content. It's going to take time. Covetousness rises up. Envy rises up in a second, in a moment. And we need habits formed in our lives that fuel us towards Christ so that the things of this world grow strangely dim in light of his glory and grace. Hebrews 13, 5 through 6 says, Keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You see the antidote to the reason why you can be content? Because Jesus has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. We confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? And then look to your home. Enter the process and look to your home. John 14, 2-3, these are the words of Jesus Christ. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. Please read that verse. The joy in this verse is not that we're going to have mansions someday. That's you again reverting back to your materialism that finds all your joy in the things you own. The, the thing of joy is that he's going to come back and he's going to take us to himself so that where he is, we may be also. We get to be with Jesus. That's the good news. That's the secret of contentment. Just by way of application, let me read you a longer text from Jeremiah Burroughs. He says, I cannot better compare the folly of those men and women who think they will get contentment by musing about other circumstances than to the way of children. Perhaps they have climbed a hill and look a good way off and see another hill, and they think if they were on top of that, they would be able to touch the clouds with their fingers. But when they are on the top of that hill, alas, they are as far from the clouds as they were before. So it is with many who think, if I were in such circumstances, then I should have contentment. And perhaps they get into those circumstances, and they are as far from contentment as before, but then they think that if they were in other circumstances, they would be contented. But when they have gotten to those circumstances, they are still as far from contentment as before. 
Contentment is not indifference to the trials and pains of life. It is a resting in Jesus Christ, no matter your lot. Some, and I, I don't want to, we got to make sure we don't, uh, we don't think of contentment as indifference. That's very important. Contentment is not something that denies the realities of pain and suffering in the world. It's something that endures it, recognizing it is real, that pain and trial and tribulation is really, really hard. And it takes a lifetime sometimes to endure through some of the things that many of you have to face. Some are discontent because they have a lot of kids and there are things they can't do because of that. Some can't have children or are trying but are so far without success. Some have had miscarriages. Some have had children and they've passed away. These are not easy circumstances. And they involve real grieving, real loss, and real pain. Some are discontent because they're getting older and they don't look the way they once did. Some are dealing with major pain. Some are facing intense surgeries. Some are bedridden. Some are at death's door. These are not easy circumstances. Some of you are in really difficult jobs, coming home to a difficult marriage, often having to face difficult children. And these are not easy circumstances. But our contentment and our joy and our peace is not found in any of these things. And it won't do for any of us, it won't do us any good to just wish for a different life. In the midst of the trial, in the midst of the pain, even as you grieve, you still have Jesus Christ. And you can endure all things through Christ who will strengthen you. He has promised he will not leave you nor forsake you. You can rest in his strength. You can know his goodness in the midst of real hard pain. Even as you grieve, to be a Christian does not mean you walk around smiling all the time. But it means that even when you aren't smiling, your contentment is found in someone who is with you, who cares for you, who loves you, who never leaves you. You can endure all things through Christ who strengthens you. You can say to your king, how would you have me live today, Lord, in the midst of my pain and sorrow? How would you have me live today? What does it look like to glorify you and treasure you in this painful circumstance? Give me strength, O oh God. That's the dependent cry of the Christian. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? I'm going to have the band return. And we're going to sing to our king. We're going to sing about his goodness, the fact that he never lets us down, to know that it's in Jesus that we find the, the secret to our contentment. But as they come and as we just ponder and reflect, would you, would you think about in your own heart and life the situation, the circumstance, the difficulty that you're facing? And would you pray and turn that over to Jesus Christ this morning? Would you just verbally in your mind or under your breath, would you just acknowledge, Jesus, I need you for this. I trust you in this. Please help me grow in recognizing that you are with me in the midst of this pain. And if you have abundance right now and you're thinking, man, I really have been living as if I didn't even need God, then would you repent? Would you repent? Because the, dain the, the contentment is a hard thing to come by when we live in a world of abundance. It is a danger to the rich to miss Jesus Christ because they have everything they need. So we've got to watch ourselves and keep reminding ourselves of our need for the King, Jesus Christ.